Welcome students to the last of your flip lectures for Unit 1. And in today's lecture, we're going to talk about the United States economy in the modern era. When we're talking about the United States economy in the modern era, we're talking about a concept called the new economy. And starting in the 1980s, the economy started to change dramatically in the United States. The types of jobs that were available and where the money was being made were in transition. Firstly, there was a decline of U.S. heavy industry manufacturing. The type of factory and production jobs that had characterized the American past were being replaced by new service-based jobs. This was called the new service economy. The other thing important to know about the new economy is that it would be largely based on new technology. So let's look at the new economy in a little bit more detail. Firstly, this would be based on technology. New computers and internet increased productivity and created new job markets. In fact, many jobs that didn't even exist before the 1980s began to become essential jobs. However, this also led to some jobs being replaced by technology. Then there's the idea of the service economy. The idea that there are more jobs and growth in the service sector than there are in actual manufacturing and production. A couple of examples would be communications, construction, transportation, healthcare, entertainment, banking, real estate, and all these other jobs that are basically based on providing services to people rather than goods. And the final piece of the new economy is that it would be a globalized economy. There would be increased international trade and multinational companies would come to run this new economy. This again is another instance of how the world has shrunk and how we are all connected in a world community now. So let's look at the globalized economy a little bit further. Firstly, the world has been connected by technology. Computers, the internet, have basically touched every sector of the economy, from banking to manufacturing to increased trade. This also has led to the specialization of goods and services. This means that a country can specialize only producing one good or one service and still compete in the economy. This is why most of the things that you see will be made in China, and you'll see fewer things that are made in the United States. And part of this specialization in goods and services has to do with increased trade. The economies of the world are now very dependent on each other, and what happens in one country will affect another. And in order to try to regulate and work out agreements between countries, many countries of the world formed the World Trade Organization in order to try to regulate and discuss how countries could profit from this new globalized world. Now let's talk about how this global economy is affecting the United States. And like most things in life, it had both positive and negative consequences. One of the positives is that the United States is the largest trading nation in the world. And what this has meant for the United States is increased wealth and a higher standard of living. All this trade has also led to lower prices for some goods, because it is cheaper to manufacture things in other countries than it is in the United States. This has also led to the increased importance of education in this country and the demand for highly skilled workers. If you wonder why we put such an emphasis on you guys having a successful run in school and then in college, it's because education and being a highly skilled, highly intelligent worker is essential to be a good worker in the United States economy. But not everything is good, and there are a lot of negative consequences to this global economy for the United States. The most obvious one is a loss of jobs in certain industries. This is known as outsourcing, where jobs that used to be done in the United States are now going to be done in other countries. This has led to the decline of U.S. manufacturing and has, has had a really big impact on certain areas of the country. For example, Detroit's economy used to be based on manufacturing cars, but since many of those jobs have been outsourced or have moved elsewhere, the city has struggled. There's also the possible consequence of the exploitation of workers, resources, and environmental destruction in foreign countries. The United States cannot regulate those countries, and so it's up to them to determine the conditions that they give to their workers, and the environmental and impact on natural resources that they're going to allow their economy to have. And ultimately, this has led to the United States being dependent on other nations. No longer is the United States really stand alone, self-sufficient, because we are reliant on other countries for many of our goods and services now. Now that we've discussed some of the theory behind these concepts, let's look at some of the actual history. 
And I want to talk about the 1990s boom and then the bust in the early 2000s that would lead to a small recession. And first off, I have to say that the, that the concept of a new technology always, always, always leads to rapid growth. New inventions always lead to new products, new services, and creates entire jobs and industries that didn't exist before. Think about how big Google has become, and now think that the internet wasn't even around 30 years ago. But in the 1990s, when the internet was invented and became available to the public, a large number of new internet-based companies that were known as dot-coms started up. Many people believe that these tech companies only could go up, and so people overinvested in them, and this created a bubble. I will discuss how a bubble is created in just a moment. But many of these new internet-based companies didn't really have a good plan for how they were going to make money off of this new internet. And so many of these companies failed, and they were for forced to close their doors. So this bust, after everyone had thought that there would be a big boom, would lead to a recession. The events of 9-11 also shook confidence in the country and contributed to the shrinkage of the economy, where basically there would be less jobs available and there would be less money out there. So now we have to talk about the idea of a bubble. In order to understand a bubble, we have to understand the idea of the stock market. And in the stock market, investors can buy a piece of a company that entitles them to a share of the profits. So if you own a piece of Coca-Cola, then you get some of the money that Coca-Cola as a company makes. And the stock market is this idea that investors can buy and sell stocks on a market, both from the companies that create these shares and also from other people who own shares as well. And like everything, supply and demand, the more people that want a stock, the higher demand there is, the higher the price will rise. So basically, if a stock is in high demand, sellers can keep raising the price. However, stocks are really only worth what the share of the company's profits will be. So for example, Apple stock is worth right now around $500 a share because a company makes a lot of money. And for that $500 a share, you are probably going to stand to make more money than that every year when Apple announces their profits and splits them. If you're confused by the idea of stocks, I would encourage you to watch an old cartoon, it's very funny, that talks about how the stock market works. You can go to the video link on the headline page and check it out. It's on the Safari Montage playlist. The video is called How the Stock Market Works. So now that we know that a bubble burst the economic boom of the 1990s, let's talk about what a bubble is. And a bubble is created when a lot of people want to buy a stock because they believe that it will be more valuable in the future. Not the present, but in the future. But this is gambling. Because sometimes people pay more for a stock than what it's worth, and in the end, if no one else will buy the stock, then they will lose money. So let's do an example. Imagine that a stock is a cookie. So I have one cookie in class, and I'm willing to sell it for $1. Now think about how many of you in my class want that cookie. You all probably want it. So let's go through a hypothetical. Nairobi is going to buy a cookie for $1 from me. That's how much I want to sell it for. But she knows that Angelo is willing to pay $2 for that cookie, so she will sell the cookie to Angelo for $2. That way, Nairobi is going to make a profit of $1. But Selena really wants that cookie, and she's willing to pay $3 for the cookie because she believes that she will be able to sell it to somebody else for $4. But after Selena has bought that cookie, all of a sudden, everybody looks around and realizes that $4 for a cookie is a pretty outrageous price to pay, and that the cookie really isn't worth $4. But unfortunately, Selena has paid $4 for a $1 cookie, and so she has gambled and lost $3 on this cookie. If you do the same thing with a stock, you have the idea of what a bubble bursting looks like. So after the dot-com bubble burst, after the internet all these internet companies didn't all pan out, the country was in an economic recession. But there was an economic savior that cropped up in the early and mid-2000s. As you can see from the picture, it was the housing market. 
And the real estate market from 2001 to 2008 boomed. This meant that the value of homes just kept going up. So that basically people who owned homes, people who were buying homes, stood to make a lot of money. But the reason for this was the idea that there were new mortgages available. And these were very, very large housing loans. Normally, when you take out a loan, and a loan on a house is called a mortgage, you only take out as much as you think you'll be able to repay. But in the early to mid-2000s, people took out loans that were way too big and that they would have a lot of difficulty repaying. But banks were willing to take on these loans, and eventually all these loans were put together and they were sold to banks. So basically, people bought up loans and then they sold them to other banks who would then try to collect the money that other people had lent. Which leads us to the idea of the Great Recession, which began in 2008 and arguably is still going on to this day. And the Great Recession is going to start when the housing bubble bursts. All of these values of homes, all of these large loans that have been taken out, would now not be able to be repaid and this would cause economic collapse. So let's talk about the housing bubble. On September 16th of 2008, the housing bubble bursts. A large number of people defaulted on their mortgages, which meant that they were unable to pay, pay the loans they had taken out to buy their homes, and so the banks had to foreclose on them, which meant that basically they took over ownership of the home. So the banks now owned a bunch of homes that people had taken out money in order to buy. As a result of foreclosures, the housing prices started to plummet. And when housing values go down, people become what is known as underwater. When the house is worth less than what you borrowed in order to pay for it, so you will lose money. For, for example, a home that is worth $100,000 when you buy it, if, you, if it becomes worth less than that, then you have lost money on your loan, because you are paying back more than you could sell your house for. And another part of this collapse was that the banks that had, lent this, that had lent this money to people and that they had bought up a bunch of these mortgages, which were known as mortgage-backed securities, lost large amounts of money in the process. They had gambled that people would be willing to pay back loans, and those gambles did not work out. As a result of the housing market, the stock market crashed. People didn't believe that the economy was strong, and they believed that basically they needed to save their money, and kind of protect themselves. So as a result, a lot of people who had invested in both banks and these stock markets would start to collapse and go bankrupt. Big firms such as Lehman Brothers, Citigroup, AIG, and Merrill Lynch had invested heavily in these mortgage-backed securities and in the housing market. So when all these loans were unable to be repaid, they lost a lot of money and they had to basically go bankrupt. So in order to understand this, we can look at the idea of the domino effect as to how the housing market burst is going to end up causing the Great Recession. Step one is that people were unable to pay back their mortgages. When you're unable to pay back a loan that you used to buy something, the bank takes over control of that asset. So the banks now own a bunch of homes, but they had lost money that they had lent to people. And whenever houses are foreclosed upon, that means that the value of your home is going to drop for more people because housing prices have to do with supply and demand as well. So when a lot of homes are foreclosed on, supply goes up, demand goes down, and so prices will go down as well. As a result of that, the banks that had lent the money or had bought up some of these loans to try to collect them later are going to lose a lot of money. And the loss of that money that they had invested is going to equal a crash in the stock market. And as a result of the stock market crashed, even businesses unrelated to real estate will go bankrupt. So, as you can see in this domino effect, this one part of the economy that collapsed ends up dragging down the rest of the economy because so much money had been invested in it. Here are some images from the day that the housing market burst and the stock market crashed.
So if you're still confused about how all this happened, I'd encourage you to check out the video Understanding the Financial Crisis on the Safari Montage playlist. It's a very good visual explanation, and I think does a pretty good job of summing up what I have just talked about. So let's take a look at some of the consequences of the Great Recession. All over the country now, there are empty houses and unfinished housing developments that were, began, that were begun during the real estate boom of the early to mid-2000s, but now are like ghost towns with nobody living in them, and many of these projects are actually unfinished. There's also been a huge rise in unemployment and underemployment. A lot of people are having to work multiple jobs, and a lot of people are only able to find part-time work. So let's talk about what the government did after the crash in 2008. In 2008, Congress approved a $700 billion bailout in order to try to revive the United States economy. The U.S. government decided to spend $700 billion to buy all of these bad loans and kind of replace those bad loans and those lost gambles by all these investors with cash that hopefully these companies would use to revive the economy, to invest again, and to basically try to fix the economy. And the reason for this was that the United States government said that some companies are too big to fail. They have too many employees, too many customers, and too much money invested that if they were allowed to collapse, that it would destroy the economy and maybe send the country into an economic crisis like the Great Depression. So, the United States in 2008 spent $700 billion to try to fix the economy. Then a year later in 2009, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was passed. This was a $787 billion stimulus, which basically is money spent by the U.S. government attempting to create economic growth. This would involve basically building roads and public works and investing in companies in order to try to create jobs and get the economy moving again. But both of these measure measures were at their time and still are very controversial. It raises the question as to what is the role of the government in the economy. The United States is supposed to be a free economy, but the United States government has at points in history stepped in to regulate it. Another controversial thing is the idea of government spending. The idea that these two measures increase the national debt, the amount of money that the United States owes to other countries and private citizens, to basically very, very high levels. There's a lot of spending and not a lot, not a lot of time, and so this increased the national debt. And then the third reason it's controversial is the idea of free market capitalism, in which companies rise and fall, and if a company fails, it fails, and another company takes its place, versus this idea of too big to fail in bailouts. So there are people who argue that no company is too big to fail, and that is our economic system of capitalism, and others who say that we simply can't have the type of large impact that one of these companies failing could have. So, the Obama stimulus, which was the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, would go into place in 2009. But, as we sit here today, the question remains, are we still in the Great Recession, or are we just in a very slow recovery? The, econ the numbers in the economy continue to increase and get a little bit better, but the country hasn't really recovered all that much yet. So I want to take a moment to address some trends in American society that I think are going to be interesting to look at in the future. The first is the idea of the digital age, the age in which we are all living, and the age that you guys are coming of age in. And so my question is, what impact will technology have on American society? We're going through a lot of changes. We now have entertainment constantly available to us, and we are now subject to targeted and specific advertising, both online, on television, on the street, anywhere we go, we are basically connected. The internet allows us to have access instantly to nearly limitless information. It's also an open forum where anybody can put out any idea that they have, but is this a healthy marketplace of ideas in which there's dialogue and exchange of valid viewpoints, or has the internet become something else entirely? The internet also means that ideas can spread rapidly, and media can spread rapidly, and information will spread rapidly. 
basically this idea is that something that happens anywhere in the world can be documented and sent out to basically anywhere else in the world. However, there's also the idea of the depersonalization of interactions, in which kind of we rely on technology and we don't have as much interaction with other human beings. Think about Facebook, think about Grubhub, think about Amazon, and all of these things that basically take the human element out of doing things. Then lastly, the idea of the digital footprint. The idea that everything you do online is chronicled somewhere. That basically, once something is online, it is there forever. So it's an interesting idea that kind of there really are no secrets anymore, and privacy may be becoming a thing of the past. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And then finally, the idea of smartphones means that we are constantly connected to both people in our area and in our friend group, but also we can be connected to people around the world. And smartphones have also meant that almost everything now is documented. Think about pictures, videos, things like that. So now we live in a time where almost everything is being documented. That's going to make it very interesting to write history in the future. I also want to look at the idea of our politics and the idea of the divided states of America. And the United States is a very polarized place. Kind of, a lot of Americans don't agree on a lot of things, and our two major political parties, the Republicans and Democrats, can't seem to find common ground on anything. And from 1987 to the present, the Pew Research Group has been polling Americans to try to figure out how they are divided on issues. And they have shown that since 1987, there has been a significant increase in the divide on Americans on the issues of the role of government and the amount of government spending that should happen, the social safety net, such as welfare programs and social security, environmental and economic regulations, as well as various social issues, such as, such as abortion, gay marriage, and other things like that. So one last trend I want to look at is the idea of new immigration and changing demographics in the United States. And immigration to the U.S. from 1986 to 2012 has shifted more towards, more towards Mexico, Central, and South America. If you just look at those numbers, that's a significant amount of people who have immigrated to this country in just a short period of time. And at the time of the 2010 census, the, the ethnic group Hispanics, and yes, I know it's not an accurate term because it's hard to lump all the different groups in from the different countries, but collectively, they made up 16% of the population. And the U.S. Census Bureau has projected that by 2050, these ethnic groups could make up to 25% of the population, which would make them an extremely influential group in the country. And so ultimately, I don't know what the impact of this will be on the United States. And ultimately, this is for your generation to decide and to be involved in. So here we are at the end of Unit 1. And this unit is really the unfinished chapter of this story. I have no idea what the United States will look like by 2050. I don't know what the United States is going to look like in 2015. But the future of this country is yours, and I encourage you to take it.